All right, so welcome to lecture four of module one with anticipation and how anticipation relates in aid in information processing. So as we look at anticipation, right? So in the previous lecture, when we start talking about reaction time, we start talking about studies, we really have an idea and discuss um, the ability to remove anticipation. So these are an unanticipated components to it. Now, when we talk about anticipation, what it does, it allows us to provide that predictability of our environment. Um, and anticipation is enhanced, the benefits of anticipation are enhanced, the more predictable our environment is. Um, unpredictable an environment removes that ability for anticipation. Right? So we have some sort of patterning um, within this environment that provides this um, ability to anticipate. And oftentimes it's from discrete events that we occur. And we'll go back to that optical flow process that we talked about in which individuals can detect changes in the environment. Um, and optic flow is one of those things where either, if there's a disruption in the flow of, uh, of what we're seeing, then that's going to provide us a, a, a stimuli that creates an, an influence, right? And if there's a pattern of optic flow that we're really recognizing or anticipating, it's easy for us um, or easier for us to create that anticipation. So um, we're going to talk about certain types of anticipation in the Poulton paper of 1957. Um, has this idea of what particular uh, types of anticipation or things that lead to it, right? So a receptor is um, detection using some sort of sensory receptor, whether it's vision or whether it's auditory. Um, and this is provided with individual uh, movement durations, um, which is more of what we're estimating, right? So if I know that a certain task should take a certain period of time, then I can provide that temporal estimation. Then we have the effector, which is the performer. So how long am I going to be taking to do such task, right? So if I look at these two com combinations, receptor and effector, I'll, I'll, I'll use what we have in this class later on, which is a baseball image. And if I'm the outfielder, right? So if somebody hits the baseball with the baseball bat as an outfielder, I need to anticipate two things. A, your receptor is where the ball is going to be. An effector is how long it's going to take me to get to where that ball is estimated to be. So that's the difference between that, right? Or simply when we get to a, a more reduced motor pattern and processing or programming, that third stage of information processing, the effector is going to be, okay, so I anticipate or the stimulus, stimulus is going to be coming in and I say, I need to predict this movement pattern, but how long is that movement pattern gonna take for me to take? And that's part of the process as well. Right? And then perceptual is environmental events that are not perceived directly. Right? So these are rather predicted um, via experience and practice. And oftentimes the perceptual, think about marching in rhythm um, and a number of the things that have beats to them and have a particular cadence that we know, and those are more of the perceptual. We're not having to um, really look at something, anticipate, we're anticipating based on our previous experience. So now we're gonna talk about spatial event. So anticipation, so when we talk about spatial anticipation, we're talking about some sort of event, right? And, and there's a stimulus and response known for future events. Pre-queuing techniques are used um, mostly going to be used in studies to hinder or prevent or to catch um, anticipation, right? But this also per queuing, if like, think back to, we keep talking about the 100 meter sprints. If I think back to on your marks, get set, those are all pre cues that are leading up to the individual um, stimuli, right? So this often allows us to do a little pre-processing and this allows us to bypass that selection, that middle stage where we have to choose which response to believe or to choose and we're already in that programming stage. So this speeds up the reaction time, right? So this, when I say speeds up reaction time, I meant reduce the amount of time taking in that reaction time period. So this is re the response selection is what is going to be removed or um, is what individuals will be 
um, sets going around to make the reduction in um, reaction time, right? There still has to be the identification piece. There has to be the response, pro response programming piece, but they do get allowed and, and provide that removal of whatever time it takes for response selection. Um, so this is a study that deal, dealt with goalkeepers um, and goalkeepers were looking at individual legs. Um, and so it was a virtual idea. Um, and so part of it is looking at what are the visual cues that the goalkeeper is using to anticipate which way the direction of the kick goes, right? And so we know that there are if I wait as a goalkeeper to see which way the ball goes, the ball should be in the back of the net. So I'm trying to take these cues and some are looking at head, kicking leg, non-kicking leg and hips. And you can see percent of viewing time, right? Um, so whether or not they were successful or not successful um, really depended upon whether or not they were gonna go through and, and make the success, okay? Um, so, most of the time, if I looked at the head or the non-kicking leg, the successful attempts looked at the non-kicking leg and the kicking leg, and they saw more um, success in the percentage of viewing time when they saw that. Temporal anticipation. Has greater effect on reducing reaction time then spatial, because the spatial anticipation of the performer still must process some of the environmental stimuli, right? Temporal anticipation identifies when the stimulus is going to be presented. So remember, temporal is time. Spatial is um, identifying where in a location this event is going to take place, right? So this provides the performer the ability to kind of eliminate the time required to react to the stimulus. Um, if you remember from previous lectures about reaction time, this four period, right, is the time between the warning given and the stimulus is given. Um, and so the components of the four period have the effects on the ability to temporarily anticipate and reduce your reaction time during the response. Um, so research has really done a, a great job of studying the effects of four periods on reaction time by looking at those within a constant duration, variable duration, um, and a aging four period. Um, and, and so that's what we have here, right? So we have individual components of that. And so the constant duration are those that have a predictable duration between the warning and the stimulus. Research has found that if the duration is short enough, then the performer can essentially pre-program their response and initial initiate the movement um, prior to the signal. This term is, is early responding. Um, the four if the four period increases in length during this period of time, during constant duration, the ability of the performer to anticipate becomes dis diminished, right? And there's so what there's what this identification is. If if I have a constant duration, as it extends, I'm no longer in that heightened state. Therefore, my ability to anticipate is diminished, and I don't reduce my reaction time. Um, the variable four periods um, are periods where um, in between trials we have different links so they're becoming more variable in that process um, the most the, the the time in four period the duration that is most probable um, has been shown to reduce the reaction time right so therefore it becomes um, faster for the person to do it and so as you become closer to the end of the expected duration, you come heightened state of, of preparation and preparedness. Um, and so you're expecting and you're maximizing at a point of the most occurring four period. So something that is your expectation or most often used is where your reaction time is gonna be heightened. Okay. And it's just that ability, like we talked about constant duration. If, if I stay away from that heightened period, then I'm going to be reducing um, then I'm going to be reducing the reaction time, making my response quicker because I'm anticipating 
if it's going away from that and I'm not allowed to, then I can't pre-plan anymore, right? Aging four periods are periods um, that tend to go longer, right? And so there's a prediction and an anticipation that is enhanced with this. Um, and, and so we include catch tiles. And what we mean by aging is as you're going further, you're anticipating, 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 um, and there's a point where you're expecting it come. This is where catch tiles often come into play. Um, so as the time elapses, the performer can prepare and anticipate that stimulus. And then it begins to get ready for the stimulus the next time the frame comes. Um, there is, um, if we look at this graph on the right hand side here and it goes drops, it stops at 2.4, um, showing that there's an increase. But if we kept going out in this greater than 2.4 seconds, we would expect to see that go back up, right? So there is some research that the optimal um, four period is between one and four seconds and beyond that, there tends to be a little bit of an increase in that reaction time. Now, when we look at this, um, we really want to focus on so the cost benefit of anticipation. So I would talk about this with certain sports, understanding that some sports, there's going to be a lot of anticipation, but we have um, a result or a penalty that comes from it, right? And think about the starting blocks, 100 meter dash, think about offsides, um, think about many different things that, that you can do, right? And so part of it in research, removing this, is if we have this temporal anticipation where we are really coming to grips with trying to um, catch or be ready to go, um, then, then we might make a false start. We may jump ahead of time. Um, and so research what is happening in the case, they, they're testing whether or not they do it. And they use it by a couple of things. They do pre-cues, right? And so part of the pre-cue is well, if they know it's coming and they anticipate it, what happens if we give them an incorrect pre-crew and they anticipate how long does it take them to correct as a result of the anticipation? Not because they're getting a um, negative effect penalty suspension or whatever is from that, but simply how long does the reaction time affect, right? So what we have are these pre-cues is you can get a neutral, a correct, or incorrect pre-crew, right? Um, and, and so the idea with these pre-crews is in Posner and his colleagues, um, they were given a pre-crew of a visual field to either do something with the left or right. They were actually pressing keys with their left hand or their right hand. Um, and it was an X that appeared on a screen and the X that appeared would either give you a left versus a right. Um, as it was presented in the field, they would have to quickly respond and do the correct one. Now, the pre-cues they were given were either gonna be the correct one, you're gonna be doing left, you're gonna be doing right, or a neutral one where they probably wouldn't give, they weren't giving you a cue, okay? Now, the idea was they were done in blocks of six um, and there was different four periods, as you can see, um, on the x-axis, the V0, 200, 400, 600, 800,000. Um, you can see the, the docs were actually what they were at. So it's like four, it was 500, 1,000, 300, uh, 150, 50, and zero milliseconds. So it was either an arrow pointing one way or the left or the next, or there was a plus sign. Half the time, the arrow was going to be correct with the pre cue. So if they were given a pre cue left button, the arrow that was the pre cue would be pointing to the left. The result indicated there was a large effect early with great visual seeing the error percentages at 156, at 150. Now, if I look at these two graphs, right? So what do we have up here? Up on the left is the reaction time. And you can see what happens with the invalid pre-cue, the neutral pre-cue, and the four period. That was, or sorry, the valid pre-cue. You can see that after the 50 milliseconds up to the 150 milliseconds is really where you see the biggest difference in deviation 
anything after the 150, they all pretty much flatline so you can see where they're at. Um, but that immediate spreading apart at 50 milliseconds shows how much reaction time causes for them to process as they were anticipating that cost them an ability and a need to recorrect the motor pattern that they had already started pre-programming due to the anticipation. Okay. The other idea is after they create this, and you can see down on the bottom right, we talk about percentage of errors. Up to that 150 milliseconds, they all created, look at the difference in errors. There was 40% error at the 150 second millisecond compared to very reduced error if it was valid um, and less than probably around 5% error if it was neutral. You can see this very drop in curve after the 150 milliseconds for the 500 and 1000, how that pre-Q lost its effectiveness following the delay because the anticipatory effect reduced a little bit. There was still evident, as you can see, the difference between almost 0% all the way up to 20% here. So the last thing we want to talk, talk to you about is this idea of signal detection theory. Um, we're going to go about this in a very calm way. Like I, I typically drive into this a little bit more, but um, I think the benefit of this is understanding that we have perceptions, individual perceptions, um, and then there's task expectations um, that really are going to help affect what our decision-making process is. And so let me talk a little bit about what this, these represent on the right-hand side, and then we'll come back and talk about what it is. So in the textbook, they use a study that really focused on um, or describes glass production. So think about a drinking glass um, that you want in those production lines that it comes out of. Now, as we think about anything production with um, equipment we utilize, I'm sure you've had some equipment that is flimsy and breaks quickly and some that is, is long duration and, and very durable. Um, and so these expectations happen. And now when you're on a product line, you have individuals that inspect these throughout the process and that's what's happening, right? So there is the actual truth and then there's employee's decision. So the employee, as this glass comes through the conveyor belt, has to decide whether or not the glass is okay or whether it's flawed. And they're supposed to take the glass off the conveyor belt if it's not, if it's flawed, and then let it go to the next one if their um, decision is that it is not flawed, that is okay, right? And so the idea is if the glass is not flawed, the employee's decision is either a correct rejection, rejection or a false alarm. If it is flawed, there's either a miss or a hit, right? And so that's the idea with this. Now, these here talk about your sensitivities. In the area that's under the curve, you're going to have some sort of criterion. The criterion is based on, A, whatever your instructions are. Some companies want mass production. Some people focus on quality. If I'm focused on quality, I'm going to have more false alarms. I'm going to lose product. If I'm focused on productivity, I'm gonna allow much more product that goes through the process that is um, flawed, right? And so some people are gonna, more people are gonna be upset that I gave them a flawed product. So that's what this all comes down to. So poor sensitivity. Um, so I can ship this right or left, depending on if my, I change what I want with my decision or instructions. I want more production, I want less production. I want you to be very focused on, on getting the best product out. And so that's what you have. Then you have the individual, like you as the person have expectations and your own viewpoints and standards. And this is all based on your past experiences, what you perceive the instructions to be, and then various biases you have about the task. And this goes along this, we use this kind of concept to go with glass making. Um, but now like think about a soccer referee trying to make a decision on whether or not a penalty is a penalty or not, right? So the idea becomes that my viewpoint and my perception of the task um, or the thing is going to determine the way I see it or the way I call it. And so we always bat on ref referees and things like that, right? But I think that there's always the experience and the expectations and then the viewpoint at which somebody comes through. A big component of this too is the signal strength, right? And so if we look at the referee, 
if I'm dead on and I can see it 100%, then I'm much more likely to call the foul. If I'm at an angle and I'm questioning myself whether it's a foul or not, maybe I go back 